Section 3 of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patty Cunningham. Xing a Paragraph by Edgar Allan Poe. As it is well known that the wise men came from the East, and as Mr. Touch-and-Go Bullethead came from the East, it follows that Mr. Bullethead was a wise man, and if collateral proof of the matter be needed, here we have it. Mr. B. was an editor. Irascibility was his sole foible, for in fact the obstinacy of which men accused him was anything but his foible, since he justly considered it his forte. It was his strong point, his virtue and it would have required all the logic of a Brownson to convince him that it was anything else. I have shown that Touch-and-Go Bullethead was a wise man, and the only occasion on which he did not prove infallible was when, abandoning that legitimate home for all wise men, the East, he migrated to the city of Alexander the Great Annopolis, or some place of a similar title, out west. I must do him the justice to say, however, that when he made up his mind finally to settle in that town, it was under the impression that no newspaper, and consequently no editor, existed in that particular section of the country. In establishing the teapot, he expected to have the field all to himself. I feel confident he would never have dreamed of taking up his residence in Alexander the Great Annopolis had he been aware that, in Alexander the Great Annopolis, there lived a gentleman named John Smith, if I rightly remember, who for many years had there quietly grown fat in editing and publishing the Alexander the Great Annopolis Gazette. It was solely, therefore, on account of having been misinformed, that Mr. Bullet had found himself in Alex, suppose we call it Nopolis, for short. But as he did find himself there, he determined to keep up his character for obst for firmness, and remain. So remain he did, and he did more. He unpacked his press, type, etc., etc., rented an office exactly opposite to that of the Gazette, and on the third morning after his arrival issued the first number of the Alex and that is to say, of the Nopolis Teapot. As nearly as I can recollect, this was the name of the new paper. The leading article, I must admit, was brilliant, not to say severe. It was especially bitter about things in general. And as for the editor of the Gazette, he was torn all to pieces in particular. Some of Bullethead's remarks were really so fiery that I have always since that time been forced to look upon John Smith, who is still alive, in the light of a salamander. I cannot pretend to give all the teapot's paragraphs verbatim, but one of them runs thus. Oh, yes. Oh, we perceive. Oh, no doubt. The editor over the way is a genius. Oh, my. Oh, goodness gracious. What is this world coming to? Oh, tempora. Oh, Moses. A philippic at once so caustic and so classical, alighted like a bombshell among the hitherto peaceful citizens of Nopolis. Groups of excited individuals gathered at the corners of the streets. Every one awaited, with heartfelt anxiety, the reply of the dignified Smith. Next morning it appeared as follows. We quote from the teapot of yesterday the subjoined paragraph. Oh, yes. Oh, we perceive. Oh, no doubt. Oh, my. Oh, goodness. Oh, tempora. Oh, Moses. Why, the fellow is all O. Oh. That accounts for his reasoning in a circle, and explains why there is neither beginning nor end to him, nor anything he says. We really do not believe the vagabond can write a word that hasn't an O oh in it. Wonder if this owing is a habit of his. By the by, he came away from down east in a great hurry. Wonder if he owes as much there as he does here. Oh, it is pitiful. The indignation of Mr. Bullethead at these scandalous insinuations I shall not attempt to describe. On the eel-skinning principle, however, he did not seem to be so much incensed at the attack upon his integrity as one might have imagined. It was the sneer at his style that drove him to desperation. What? 
he touch-and-go bullet-head not able to write a word without an o in it he would soon let the jackanape see that he was mistaken yes he would let him see how much he was mistaken the puppy he touch-and-go bullet-head of frog pondium would let mr john smith perceive that he bullet-head could indict if it so pleased him a whole paragraph ay a whole article in which that contemptible vowel should not once not even once make its appearance but no that would be yielding a point to the said john smith he bullet-head would make no alteration in his style to suit the caprices of any mr smith in christendom perish so vile a thought the o forever he would persist in the o he would be as oey as oey could be burning with the chivalry of his determination the great touch-and-go in the next teapot came out merely with this simple but resolute paragraph in reference to this unhappy affair the editor of the teapot has the honor of advising the editor of the gazette that he the teapot will take an opportunity in to-morrow morning's paper of convincing him the gazette that he the teapot both can and will be his own master as regards to style he the teapot intending to show him the gazette the supreme and indeed the withering contempt with which the criticism of him the gazette inspires the independent bosom of him the teapot by composing for the especial gratification of him the gazette a leading article of some extent in which the beautiful vowel the emblem of eternity yet so offensive to the hyper-exquisite delicacy of him the gazette shall most certainly not be avoided by his the gazette's most obedient humble servant the teapot so much for buckingham in fulfilment of the awful threat thus darkly intimated rather than decidedly enunciated the great bullet-head turning a deaf ear to all entreaties for copy and simply requesting his foreman to go to the devil when he the foreman assured him the teapot that it was high time to go to press turning a deaf ear to everything i say the great bullet-head sat up until daybreak consuming the midnight oil and absorbed in the composition of the really unparalleled paragraph which follows so ho john how now told you so you know don't crow another time before you're out of the woods does your mother know you're out oh no no so go home at once now john to your odious old woods of concord go home to your woods old owl go you won't oh po po don't do so you've got to go you know so go at once and don't go slow for nobody owns you here you know oh john john if you don't go you're no homo no you're only a fowl an owl a cow a sow a doll a pall a poor old good-for-nothing to nobody log dog hog or frog come out of a conquered bog cool now cool do be cool you fool none of your crowing old cock don't frown so don't don't holo nor howl nor growl nor bow wow wow good lord john how you do look told you so you know but stop rolling your goose of an old pall about so and go and drown your sorrows in a bowl exhausted very naturally by so stupendous an effort the great touch-and-go could attend to nothing farther that night firmly composedly yet with an air of conscious power he handed his missive to the devil-in-waiting and then walking leisurely home retired with ineffable dignity to bed meantime the devil to whom the copy was entrusted ran upstairs to his case in an unutterable hurry and forthwith made a commencement at setting the missive up in the first place of course as the opening word was so he made a plunge into the capital s hole and came out in triumph with the capital s elated by this success he immediately threw himself upon the little o box with a blindfold impetuosity but who shall describe his horror when his fingers came up without the anticipated letter in their clutch who shall paint his astonishment and rage at perceiving as he rubbed his knuckles that he had been only thumping them to no purpose against the bottom of an empty box not a single little o was in the little o hole 
and glancing fearfully at the capital o partition he found that to his extreme terror in a precisely similar predicament awe-stricken his first impulse was to rush to the foreman sir he said gasping for breath i can't never set up nothing without no o's what do you mean by that growled the foreman who was in a very ill humor at being kept so late why sir there bean't an o in the office neither a big un nor a little un what what the d l has become of all that were in the case i don't know sir said the boy but one of them ere gazette devils has been prowlin about here all night and i spect he's gone and cabbaged em every one dod rot him i haven't a doubt of it replied the foreman getting purple with rage but i tell you what you do bob there's a good boy you go over the first chance you get and hook every one of their eyes and de in them their izzards jist so replied bob with a wink and a frown i'll be into em i'll let em know a thing or two but in de meantime that ere paragrab must go in to-night you know else there'll be the devil to pay and and not a bit of pitch hot interrupted the foreman with a deep sigh and an emphasis on the bit is it a long paragraph bob shouldn't call it a weary long paragraph said bob ah oh, well then do the best you can with it we must get to press said the foreman who was over his head and ears in work just stick in some other letter for o nobody's going to read the fellow's trash anyhow very well replied bob here goes it and off he hurried to his case muttering as he went considerable vel them air expressions particular for a man as doesn't swar so as to gouge out all their eyes eh and d and all their gizzards vel this here's the chap as is just able for to do it the fact is that although bob was but twelve years old and four feet high he was equal to any amount of fight in a small way the exigency here described is by no means of rare occurrence in printing offices and i cannot tell how to account for it but the fact is indisputable that when the exigency does occur it almost always happens that x is adopted as a substitute for the letter deficient the true reason perhaps is that x is rather the most superabundant letter in the cases or at least it was so in the old times long enough to render the substitution in question an habitual thing with printers as for bob he would have considered it heretical to employ any other character in a case of this kind than the x to which he had been accustomed i shall have to x this ere paragraph said he to himself as he read it over in astonishment but it's just about the awfulest o e paragraph i ever did see so x it he did unflinchingly and to press it went x next morning the population of nopolis were taken all aback by reading in the teapot the following extraordinary leader s x h x j x h n h x w n x w t x l d y x u s x y x u k n x w narrator's note as illustrated the entire article has had the letter o replaced by the letter x which makes it unpronounceable the remainder of the article will be read in plain english End narrator's note so ho john how now told you so you know don't crow another time before you're out of the woods does your mother know you're out oh no no so go home at once now john to your odious old woods of concord go home to your woods old owl go you won't oh po po don't do so you've got to go you know so go at once and don't go slow for nobody owns you here you know oh john john if you don't go you're no homo no you're only a fowl an owl a cow a sow a doll a pall a poor old good-for-nothing to nobody log dog hog or frog come out of a conquered bog cool now cool do be cool you fool none of your crowing old cock don't frown so don't don't holo nor howl nor growl nor bow wow wow good lord john how you do look told you so you know but stop rolling your goose of an old pall about so and go and drown your sorrows in a bowl 
the uproar occasioned by this mystical and cabalistic article is not to be conceived the first definite idea entertained by the populace was that some diabolical treason lay concealed in the hieroglyphics and there was a general rush to bullet head's residence for the purpose of riding him on a rail but that gentleman was nowhere to be found he had vanished no one could tell how and not even the ghost of him has ever been seen since unable to discover its legitimate object the popular fury at length subsided leaving behind it by way of sediment quite a medley of opinion about this unhappy affair one gentleman thought the whole an excellent joke another said that indeed bullet head had shown much exuberance of fancy a third admitted him eccentric but no more a fourth could only suppose it the yankees designed to express in a general way his exasperation say rather to set an example to posterity suggested a fifth that bullet head had been driven to an extremity was clear to all and in fact since that editor could not be found there was some talk about lynching the other one the more common conclusion however was that the affair was simply extraordinary and inexplicable even the town mathematician confessed that he could make nothing of so dark a problem x everybody knew was an unknown quantity but in this case as he properly observed there was an unknown quantity of x the opinion of bob the devil who kept dark about having his x to the paragraph did not meet with so much attention as i think it deserved although it was very openly and very fearlessly expressed he said that for his part he had no doubt about the matter at all that it was a clear case that mr bullet head never could be persuaded for to drink like other folks but was continually a svigging o oh, that ere blessed x x x ale and as a natural consequence it just puffed him up savage and made him x cross in the extreme end of section three recording by patty cunningham